Hello. <laughs> Let's begin the Q&A session. First, Fraser. Oh, um, I was just wondering if China can still be considered as strictly communist in this sense, in the, uh, given that the fact that the Chinese economy is now more open than it was before. So, do I expect that Chinese economy will be more open? Yes, that's right. Well, after all, they say open and reform are the prerequisite for their development, and also uh, since 1978, when the Teng Xiaoping declared opening reform is the uh, first and most foremost policy they pursued. So the general trend lies in that direction, I believe. Of course, some the foreign entrepreneur has complained that the, the system, or particularly the legal judiciary system, is not the same as that of in other countries. I might say sometimes whether this country is governed by law or by person. But the years go by, I believe that the, that kind of complaints will be reduced because the, the government is uh, very strong that should govern the all things by law. So, but still, the socialist market economy means that's not the real market economy, I must say. So, there is a quite similarity between uh, the market economy and the socialist market economy, but that's the same that there is uh, some difference. So, uh, any uh, foreign investor uh, is very much cautious about uh, the what's going on in China. And then uh, year by year, there has been some change. So, but the, the general direction is more widened, more open their society, but still that level as much as that in other Western countries. So I'm wondering whether my explanation could meet your question. Okay, next. Okay, yeah, I'm also here. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my question is actually about the part of your presentation about the basic requirements. Uh, I was wondering how much of these basic requirements are followed by Korea and well, obviously China, and how much of influence does the United States have on Korea to follow these basic requirements of you know, like having a better relationship in the future? Well, I must confess that I'm too old to understand <laughs> through that the speakers, really, not clear to me. So <laughs> okay, let me ask yeah. you again. So uh, uh, yeah. the point, you, could, you, could you repeat? Uh, I, just want, I was just wondering how much of influence does the United States have on Korea as following the basic requirements for having a better relationship with China in the future? Uh, you mean some, uh, so, well, uh, delicate relations between United States and China vis-a-vis -vis Korea? Yes. Well, after all, when I was in the foreign ministry and uh, making uh, any kind of decision, of course, we consider many factors. The alliance with the United States is also always a standing consideration aspect. But in real question, real problems, uh, I believe we better independently decide what's going on, with, what we are going to do with China. And then uh, I don't believe that the United States uh, try to make any kind of direct influence on Korea when they make a uh, any kind of decision. But Korea should be well aware of the geopolitical situation surrounding himself. We, after all, have a good alliance with the United States while we are 
now in the strategic cooperative partnership with China. So both are not zero-sum game. We should be good to have a both, I mean, good relationship with both two parts. So sometimes China would like to make a certain influence on Korea when he has uh, something to do with United States and the other might be the versus. Is the same true? But I hope that the, my Korean colleagues in the foreign ministry as well as in other uh, serious, I mean, serious uh, authority, the agencies to make his own decision only under the under the basis of national interest, independent national interest. Sometimes it is very close to the United States, sometimes it is very close to Chinese. But after all, we should protect our national, I mean, Korea should protect his national interests first with certain consolation with, for, I mean, China as well as United States. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> My question is about uh, China and the United States. So after the Trump uh, el got elected, uh, the United States government is more focused on the U.S. internal issues as well. For example, the Trump says that America first always. So I, this I is. I think. Uh, I should come to anybody who make a question cross while you use the microphone because that should the count? voice is through the micro I mean the speaker and not clear to my ear. So I'd better go to okay. Well same the situation I feel so that the uh, yeah. So I just can hear and I think it's much Yeah, well yeah. you better use your microphone for your colleagues. Ah okay. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask about the relation, the U.S. and China soft power. Of course, in terms of like hard power, military power, the U.S. is, the US is much more stronger. Like we cannot compare with China. In terms of soft power, the China is rising much more in Asia, in Africa, I believe, also in Latin America. So after the U.S., uh, the new U.S. president, the, their policy is more uh, the U.S. Uh, concentrated on the United States. For example, the Trump says America first, and they are not. Uh, they are leaving some international agreements like Paris Climate Change, and they are reviewing their like many of their FTAs. Do you think this is a golden chance for China to? increase their soft power over other countries in Africa or, for example, in Asia? Well, we have very uh, unprecedented president in the United States, that's I uh, feel. Uh, Mr. Trump, of course, elected by the American citizen, but the, uh, uh, it's some, some difference uh, I've got since his, uh, when I heard his boy, his uh, remarks or his attitude, of course he declared the American first. His campaign was American first, and then to, what do you say, the uh, increase the American first policy. While well, China, long time, tried to be long time friend to developing countries. Although their economy was not enough to make a good assistance to many developing countries, but they did for American, uh, African, and Latin America. Uh, we can see some decreasing sign of American leadership in the world, particularly when the Mr. Trump declares American firstism. But as I already mentioned, that. Uh, his its, uh, economic power as well as military power uh, is not compared to any from other countries. Although Mr. Trump has his own personal view or personal inclination, 
Many uh, American politicians and decision makers feel that America should lead the, the nation under the, uh, the universal value uh, prevailing. You know. So China, at the same time, has continued to develop itself, reaching the, to be called as G2. When they were not enough to provide any assistance to foreign countries, they did. Now they have a capable of making good assistance to many other developing countries. And Mr. I mean, President Xi declared that uh, he is willing to. He has intention to make uh, assist to make more assistance to make a more contribution to a better world. So. It's nothing directly related to the current attitude of Mr. Trump with the, some positive sign from the China. I think their national policy is provide more to the, uh, the developing countries. So their well, contribution will be uh, bigger than before. While still, I believe the American leadership could prevail in worldwide, although the Mr. Trump is not so positive in that direction. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, just sort of continuing with um, the sort of theme with uh, President Trump, obviously. Um, President Trump and President Xi have had several uh, meetings since Trump was elected last year. Um, how do you see uh, China cooperating with the United States on the issue of North Korea and reunification? Well, uh, not only these issues relating to Korean Peninsula, but on many issues concerned, sometimes they will cooperate, or sometimes they will compete, or sometimes they were in confrontation. Uh, the recent visit of Mr. Trump to China was quite successful in his terms. We expect something new or something fascinating relating to North Korean issues to come out, but unfortunately, there is no noticeable outcome of this meeting we got vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Korean question. North Korea is still believed, to my judgment, a strategic asset for China particularly vis-a-vis vis -vis U.S.-related matter. Although the North Korea made a very uh, wrongdoing and violating the international law and uh, many uh, resolutions adopted by the United Nations Security Council. Well, the, the other day, the U.S. designated North Korea as terrorist assisting country again, terrorist country. So I hope two big powers could have more in agreement while dealing with North Korea, but there is certain limitation. But after all, they are all P5 who is responsible for world affairs, particularly non-proliferation issue. So it's their duty to solve the question, solve the North Korean nuclear question. So at least the nuclear nuclear question should be solved through the cooperative, cooperation between two big powers. That's my hope. But reality well, could have seen differently. But at the moment, North Korea doesn't want any dialogue, only waiting for the time. Seems to be, seems to waiting for the time to show their another military big capabilities by testing another nuclear testing, conducting a nuclear test as well as launching long-range missile. So I believe not only United States, but China and international society as a whole should get united 
uh, to make a certain decision, to make uh, well, action, to show action that we cannot accept the North Korean adventurous provocation anymore. So, you turn to your question, there would be sometimes cooperation, sometimes confrontation, but vis-a-vis -vis the North Korean nuclear question, they are obliged to make a good cooperation to each other. Thank you. Um, you said that North Korea and China still have a close relationship, but recently China banned travel, all travel to North Korea. Most view that as them severing ties with North Korea. What would you uh, interpret that as? Instead of it, like, would you say that they're now backing away from North Korea to join, become closer to South Korea and the U.S., or are they just severing ties with a controversial country? Um, well, China just recently uh, banned all travel to North Korea, and uh, you said that China and North Korea are still very close, but with this recent ban, would you say that now China is severing all ties with North Korea, or are they just uh, like ending a, oh, I guess. Uh, Well, the U.S. Uh, resolution regarding North Korea nuclear test uh, stipulate quite items which should be observed by the member states of the United Nations. I don't believe that the uh, banning of tourists to, to North Korea is included in that the resolution. But the, certainly there is a, well, the stop of uh, uh, trade stuff of export importation from North Korea, particularly in coal and uh, some textiles, and then the labor forces they cannot utilize for making products or something like that. I think if the China bans uh, tourists, Chinese tourists to visit uh, uh, North Korea, uh, it's, it's because mostly their own policy, yeah. To visit North Korea is not the ban, but the, uh, the situation on the, in the North Korea are not so safe, I mean, the predictable. So they make uh, temporary certain measure uh, not to encourage Chinese tourists while well, falling into any jeopardy in North Korea. But there are quite a number of uh, items which are uh, prohibited by the uh, resolutions adopted in the United Nations Security Council. Uh, and then some, many countries are, not suppo are supposed not to receive any uh, well, visit of North Korea, some relating to developing nuclear capabilities or developing missile. So those are the items, list of uh, uh, prohibit uh, by the uh, UN Security Council. So that question regarding the uh, tourist ban, I don't believe is in the list. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I, you, you talk a lot about the economic situation, right? Um, so how China has grown economically, but I want to ask you more about human rights. So um, there has been a lot of um, North Korean people like going to China to get to South Korea because they cannot uh, cross the DMZ. So, um, but they do not have the refugee status there. Um, so. I would like to know what has South Korea done to to pressure or to um, raise awareness of the situation 
uh, of North Koreans in China, uh, like for China to change that policy. Uh, thank you. I think easy way I and mean, convenient way to respond. If I hear it at your side, then I can reply using this microphone. Yeah. Okay. Well, ref I mean the North Korean uh, refugee is the one of the very serious and thorny questions. Whenever I was in Beijing, in Seoul, we try to convince, persuade Chinese authority, please take it only through humanitarian consideration. While the Chinese replied, it's a matter of legal matter, North Korean who crossed the border illegally. So it's directly linked to their, what do you say, the legal matters, yeah. So there is always kind of confrontation and it depends on situation. When there is a good mood between China and South Korea, some North Korean refugee cases handled relatively easily, while the relations are not so good enough, uh, then the, those uh, miserable North Korean has been deported to uh, North Korea uh, despite of our uh, what do you say, uh, continued appeal. So uh, we cannot uh, dismiss uh, the aspect of legal legality on this matter. At the same time, we hope that the, uh, uh, China would pay more attention uh, in the uh, humanitarian aspect on this matter. Now the China declared by his lengthy report at the National Congress of Communist Party, uh, China wants to be a building a shared value of mankind and making a good contribution for a betterment of mankind. And then this is absolutely related to humanitarian aspect. So I do hope uh, that the stance and position of Chinese government vis-a-vis -vis North Korean refugee could be better than before. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, my question is about the recent news of the normalization okay. uh, of, okay. of the question relating what to the n normalization of relations between China and Republic of Korea uh, after thought recent news about how uh, the two countries are um, how China is open to uh, restore its relations with Korea um, like for example the economic fallout that uh, arose after the deployment of thought. What do you think are the main reasons for China to be open to restore relations with Republic of Korea and how does this um, normalization affect the dynamic of the North Korean nuclear problem? Well, to find a certain better way to solve the North Korean nuclear question is standing tasks, challenges, and problems which both countries try to find, you know. So uh, to do with the North Korean nuclear question is, has nothing to do with the current problem between China and Korea uh, in relating to the third deployment in Korea. About third deployment, every country has his own sovereign right how to keep, how to defend his country. So I think the, uh, my government decision to deploy Saad in my territory is absolutely legitimate. Of course, we understand why China has a different opinion on that because saying that Saad deployment undermined making a bad impact on their strategic uh, security interest. My personal view is Chinese uh, concern was not 
proportionate with uh, that has, I mean, the proportionate with the real fact. I mean, their reason to be against this deployment lies first is uh, against their strategic, uh, the national interest. That means when there would be a nuclear war between China and certain countries, that radar system of thought will function against their national interest, their, their strategic interest. But our cause to have the thought system in Korea is directly linked to our life and death question. We are obliged to deploy that system because of imminent North Korean threat with nuclear bomb and long and medium and short range missile. So it's, di it's a real question. But when you, when, you, when you think about possible nuclear war, this is, a, well, it's not real. It's, if that kind of war happened, everybody will be destroyed. So it's not proportionate between the concerns what South Korea has and that of China. But anyhow, anyhow, the last, the October 30, one agreement between two authorities concerned has agreed to restore uh, the, the relations which is now harmed more or less to back to the normal. I think it's good agreement. But still, uh, they declare, I mean China, make it clear that they are opposed, opposing to deployment, while the South Korea has made an explanation why we have. So I hope that, that China will be in the position to understand the real reason of South Korea with regard to the deployment of SARS system in Korea. And, well, the, as I said already, the, the exchange of people and goods is quite general, I mean, the, the unavoidable, yeah. So, uh, such a uh, intentional rupture of the exchange are not natural. So, we will go back to the normal, having a good, uh, I mean, the strengthening our bilateral relations of mutual, mutually beneficial to each other. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, President Xi successfully consolidated his power when he got re-elected as the Communist Party's leader. So I was wondering how these developments may affect Korea-China relations. Well, President Xi is very uh, friendly to Korea I, in a world. When I was in Beijing, I had a delegation from Korea uh, to send a message of president elected uh, then in 19, uh, 2013 to President Xi. We were all surprised to hear that his knowledge on Korea. Before, uh, I mean, when we were in, under uh, the imperial occupation, he mentioned by himself certain name of Korea, very most famous patriot, Kim Gu, and even monks. I mean, the monk. So I'm very uh, happy to see that uh, he continues his uh, well role as a general secretary as well as president of China for four, five more years. Well, it's a matter of fact. Well, when he was elected. In five years ago, everybody would believe has the same well, feeling that he will continue after five years. So it's quite natural. But after five years, so far, so far, as I already explained, that the two terms for general secretary, two terms for the president, was kind of a practice, which Deng Xiaoping designed to set up. So I'm wondering, really, I'm wondering whether he will, well, ignore such presence. Well, of course, you have a good, I mean, China has a good reason to do so because 
they are supposed to celebrate 100th anniversary of the Communist Party establishment. But the, uh, I don't know. But in case when he continue to his presidentship or general secretary's job after five years from now on, I better I decline make a comment. Thank you. My question is about uh, developing countries. Like, for example, right now, developing countries has a lot of influence of the Western societies, Western culture. I mean, democracy, or you have to do some stuff in order to develop. However, we have seen that countries like China and other ones like Singapore or even the Emirates have developed with another type of, of political culture. So do you think that China is in, in a good position to spread their, their, their political culture or political system? Well, as I put uh, some uh, characteristics, identity of China, first I refer the uh, Chinese Communist Party, one party, one political party system there. Well, everybody has their own evaluation, whether it's good or whether it's not, but I do believe it's really Chinese who decide who has a right to choose their own political system. Of course, somebody wants to make it uh, clear that the democracy cannot be sustained only with one party. But Chinese uh, insist we are doing our socialistic policy with our own characteristics. What characteristics? We don't have such a big country whose population 1.4 billion. We don't have such countries whose ethnic minority over 55. We don't have such countries who was suffered a lot of uh, foreign aggression, particularly in 19th century. Every country has their own special situation like Korea. We are only the divided country in the world at this moment. We were engaged in free ties, free cycle, I mean, brother's law for three years. We are the unique in that sense. So China is unique for themselves. So we better, I always said to my Korean colleagues, just see it as a fact. So we don't have to pay any value-oriented evaluation. That's my personal feeling. So, but China cannot export his political system to others. Of course, some other country has a choice, their right to choose. Like, uh, well, some in Latin America, well, they, I mean, they, they are working for hard, some kind of populist the policy, and then we see the result. So China, okay, you have a right to keep your own unique political system, but don't try to make any attempt to explore that kind of political system. When in 60s and even in 70s, there are some faction in certain developing country who, well, quite respect uh, the certain ism, you know, close to the China. But the, uh, as long as China has their own right to choose their own choice, uh, choose their own system, mm, no one can yeah, either direct or whether it is good or not, they can insist. This is my personal view. Well, there are some others who may have a different idea, uh, from, particularly from the Western world. Of course, we are, I'm also in the uh, aspiration, have a aspiration for universal value, well, consisting of human rights and uh, freedom of press and democracy. You know, of course, China is always saying the democratic way democracy and people's democracy. So there are several interpretations. What is democracy? Demo uh, democracy, yeah, democracy. So sometimes we have our Korean democracy in 1980s, yeah, 70s and 70s. I was very hurry. I was very busy to explain what is Korean democracy when I was uh, a young 
uh, diploma. But the, uh, we don't have to have certain, what they say, the expression like democracy is democracy, not Korean democracy or Chinese democracy or Western democracy. There is one democracy. That's my belief. Okay. The, my last question. Ah, uh, no. One more time to, to ten minutes about. So thank you for your uh, thank you for your presentation. My question relates to the border dispute between China and India in Doklam and Bhutan. So my question is, how do you think it should be resolved between, particularly between Bhutan and China, with China clearly willing to increase their influence and dependence of Bhutan to the Chinese government? Well, I know that the India and China has a long time the border questions, and I uh, quite recently they uh, they agree to settle down such a border issue between two of them. But it's the first time to hear that Bhutan has a border problem with China, and then those long time questions border question between China and India was solved through dialogue. Of course, there is a military, uh, what do you say, uh, action between two of them, particularly on the uh, Himalaya side or something like that. But there was uh, some uh, uh, cases, however, but the, the, source, the solution was made through dialogue, discussion. So I hope that the original border question between Bhutan and China, however, the solution is very clear through dialogue and discussion. Well. Well, for Korea, we are, well, in some sense, a small country. We, our territory is only 100,000 square kilometers wide. China is 9.6 million uh, square kilometers. So sometimes, uh, well, such a big country can be more, or what do you say, generous with regard to territorial question, but it's not true. It's not, never happened. So territory is observed, is uh, one of the top priority national interests. So one should fight, one should not physical, physically meaning, but the, uh, one try to make their best to convince the, the region, our region to uh, the other counterpart. So I hope that the, uh, that the border question could be solved through peaceful dialogue. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your a lot of questions, and uh, I feel regret that the, my hearing was not good enough <laughs> to have a very uh, exchange of uh, questions in more comfortable way. But anyhow, it is very unique and very uh, uh, precious time for me, particularly. I am now to this year 66 years, but the, I have uh, so happy to have such a young generation which she continues to give a kind of energy with which I can spend today quite well. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>